Good morning, everyone. My name is Jane Tillman Irving. Welcome to this very important session on women leaders in media, making innovative technology work for women and girls. Very important issue, important to all of us. My name is Jane Tillman Irving. I'm the immediate past president of the New York Press Club, a retired reporter, decades as a 35 years at WCBS radio, television, other radio stations, and I've been a professor at the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University. And my point is in telling you all that, that tech was different when I started out. Can you say reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, cassette recorders, a payphone on the street to file your story, and if you wanted to find out something, you went to a book, usually called an encyclopedia. And I also want to tell you that this was not when dinosaurs were roaming the earth. We were not, you know, flying on pterodactyls or anything of that nature. Some of these technologies go back to the mid-90s. So um, it still comes down, though, to the same thing. Getting the story, get it, telling the truth, doing it as fast and as accurately as possible. That's journalism, that's storytelling, that's whatever we do as women in media. It's the same thing. But thank goodness, technology has increased, has improved, and we are carrying computers in our pockets that even as recently as the 70s could not even, the 80s could not even have been imagined. So, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, some of you young ones, when I say reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders or cassettes, ask your mother. Um, but it's very important, though, that as tech changes, that we as women not be left behind. And that is the purpose of our panel today. We're talking of, with a number of women who have been innovators and leaders in the technological field. And we're going to start with Leah. <laughs> yes, I, I, we have changed our, our lineup and things change very quickly. Leah Mann, Communications and Community Management Officer for Broadband for the International um, Telecommunications. Telecommunications Union's Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. She's going to talk to us about the role of ITU in its digital sphere and AI. Very important, AI. It may replace us all, but not yet. Thank you, Ms. Irving. Um, and thank you to the UN Department of Global Communications and the International Association of Women in Radio and Television for hosting us today. Esteemed colleagues, we are here today because digital technologies are an essential pathway to gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. When women and girls have access to innovative technologies, society as a whole benefits. As I'm sure many of you have heard the, and discussed this week, there's a large gap in gender parity when it comes to the use of digital technologies. Let me share some key numbers with you. Today, approximately 5.3 billion people, or two-thirds of the world's population, use the internet, leaving 2.7 billion people offline. Many more who count as connected, cannot use it meaningfully in the ways that you or I take for granted because of issues like lack of affordability or an unreliable connection. According to ITU data, globally, 69% of men use the internet compared to just 63% of women, resulting in nearly 260 million more men than women using the internet just last year. And while women account for roughly half of the global population, they represent a disproportionate and increasing share of the offline population, outnumbering male non-users by 
The gap in digital skills also continues to expand, creating an urgent and specific need for programs, policies, and advocacy promoting equal access to digital skills education, technology, and services specifically for women and girls. ITU's estimate indicates that women and girls are 25% less likely than men to know how to leverage digital technology for basic purposes. Globally, girls are less likely to participate in STEM subjects, areas of study that often spark an interest in innovative technologies. And according to UNESCO, female students represent only 35% of all students enrolled in STEM-related disciplines in higher education, and in addition to which, women who enter STEM professions leave in disproportionate numbers as compared to men. ITU, as the UN Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, works collaboratively with our members and partners to build programs that have a measurable, lasting impact on the gender digital divide to ensure that everyone has meaningful connectivity. We raise awareness and promote the active participation of women and girls in ICT and STEM related education so that they have the tools to pursue careers in these fields. Over the years, ITU has led several programs and initiatives to engage women and girls more closely in the global digital transformation. One example is the ITU-led International Girls in ICT Day, coming up on April 27th, uh, a flagship global effort to raise awareness, empower, and encourage girls and women to pursue studies and careers in STEM. Since its launch in 2011, more than 377,000 girls and young women have taken part in over 11,000 celebrations in 171 countries. In addition, I2, in partnership with UN Women, GSMA, and the ITC, lead a coalition called Equals. This is a multi-stakeholder partnership with the goal of bridging gender digital divide by empowering women and girls to become creators, users, and leaders in the technology field. Equals produces reports, houses a digital skills hub, which is a platform for locating educational resources and projects for women and girls, and hosts an intergenerational dialogue between women leaders in tech and young women, among many other excellent programs. Finally, a more recent initiative is called Partner to Connect, or P2C. P2C is a multi-stakeholder alliance to foster meaningful connectivity and digital transformation globally, with a focus on, but not limited to, the hardest to connect communities. Since its launch in 2021, P2C has received over 500 pledges valued at over 29 billion projects around the world with submissions from over 200 countries, almost half of which focus on digital inclusion. Notwithstanding these efforts, no entity can close the gender digital divide alone. Multi-stakeholder partnerships are critical for reaching gender equality. Just last week, Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin, who happens to be the first woman Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union in its 158 years of existence, called on all stakeholders to unify their efforts on three key actions to help close the digital gender divide. First, to get girls into STEM early and empower them with digital skills. Second, to ensure women and girls have access to tech and base decisions on data. And third, to give women a seat at the digital table making gender equality a must in every organization. The media has an important role to play in promoting gender equality. By combating stereotypes and showcasing the accomplishments of women in tech and serving as a platform for them to share their stories. We must use language and imagery that is inclusive and empowering for everyone. We must encourage young women to see themselves as leaders in technology and that starts with providing them with visible role models and supporting their ambitions. Eliminating gender stereotypes and promoting women's equal participation in technology is a collective responsibility. We must work together to ensure that women have access to the resources and support they need to succeed in the digital world. Thank you. Thank you. Our format today is going to be, we will have presentations from all of our panelists followed by a question and answer session. In order to activate your microphone, there's a white button to the right, and when you are called upon, that's how you will be able to ask your question. But that comes a little later. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Michelle Ferrier, the president of the International Association of Women in Radio and Television, and she is the executive director of Media Innovation Collaboratory. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Michelle Ferrier, and I'm the executive director of the Media Innovation Collaboratory, and uh, founder of the project Trollbusters, which is an online technological service to support journalists who are experiencing online harms through our technologies and our services. A little bit of background, though, on who I am might help in understanding the context in which I build and the work that I do. Um, when I was in high school, uh, the age of some of the people in the room here, I was able to participate in a program at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center for emerging young scientists. Um, I was selected out of my school for this program, which was uh, basically a program for um, disadvantaged children of color to be able to experience STEM careers directly working with scientists at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. At the time, I was into science fiction and I wanted to be an astronaut when I grew up. Ultimately though, my goal became to be a cultural ambassador and use technological tools to unite people. And that's what the approach that I take to the work that I do um, in building technological spaces. Some of the work that we do at the Media Innovation Collaboratory is about helping journalists, media workers, and communicators understand the technological environment, understand uh, the digital world and how to navigate it, as well as creating curriculum for young people to help them understand their role as digital citizens and how to create their digital identity and a platform for powerful voice. Some of the work that we've done recently has been in Ethiopia, working to build an independent media sector of journalists united across the country to support each other, as well as to support their communities in providing vital local news and information. This is key to one of the key criteria, I think, that we need in terms of building for the future, which is a collaborative space where we have people of diverse backgrounds and experiences at the table when the products themselves are being built. If we could advance to the next slide, please. And so the work that we do uses a variety of different processes um, from human-centered design to design thinking to community centered development, where we're putting the people in our communities at the center of our work. What you're seeing is some of the graphic recording work that came out of our workshop recently, this past February in Addis Ababa. And we use visuals as a part of our work because uh, the technology, visual is ascendant when we look at our technologies right now, and memes and other types of things are providing people with information, entertainment, and other types of communications. As journalists, we're using these tools to try and reach our communities and provide them with information, but also to utilize the experiences and knowledge of our community in order to be able to build better tools and ways of communicating with them. Next slide, please. And so part of what we need to do in terms of ensuring that women and girls are at the table is providing opportunities to collectively work together, create programs where they are given the skills to be able to level up and develop their digital, digital uh, culture skills, as well as to understand how the technologies themselves work so that they can leverage the power of those technologies to be able to affect change in their communities. Next slide, please. Um, the work has been distributed in a variety of different formats, key to the strategies for creating voice and power and amplifying uh, our issues around awareness of gender-based violence and other types of issues specific to women and girls. 
our magazine, Toxic Avenger magazine, specifically looks at the digital harms in our spaces, helps people to understand the technological function of algorithms, of the platforms, and how they might be able to be manipulated and used uh, for harm, as well as how you might be able to protect yourself in this work. This award-winning magazine has provided analysis around the globe of online harms, threats against journalists, and the challenges that they face as women in the in-between carrying the stories of our communities to the public. And so in that space, in the in-between, our women journalists are being uh, threatened both online and offline as they're trying to shape and form the stories that we all live out of as women, as men, as humans on our planet. Next slide, please. Some of the work that we've done also has been deeply with looking at young people and helping them to understand the tool that they use in their hands. Um, as a college professor, I recognize that a lot of my students have phones and don't understand how data gets from one place to the other around the globe. And so we developed a curriculum that takes students from how the internet works all the way through to understanding situational awareness, how you connect on the web, understanding social influencers and how it's measured, understanding inside the black box of the algorithms and how they are built and coded and how they are used and can be manipulated to create biases and harms against individuals. So as we're looking to build technologies, we have to look to the intersectionality of the different persons that we're ad addressing in our design thinking to make sure that our solutions aren't going to cause secondary harms to populations within our audiences. Next slide, please. Some of the work that we're doing is working with college students, high school students, and others in a collective way to help them not only train them on the digital skills so that they can level up, but also use them to uh, develop as peer educators, actually developing, to have them develop the tools to help teach their colleagues and peers about digital skills. Our, our, our level up campaign, our great escape uh, competition is one where students build escape room modules where they can test and in a sandbox online test their digital skills in uh, trying to solve the puzzles online. I think a key to part of our strategies for developing technology has to be that we make sure that all of the folks are in the room as our technology is developed. Next slide please. And so as a part of the work that I do with our International Association of Women in Radio and Television, our strategy is to use the technologies to pull together the resources of our community from across the globe. We represent over 400 women journalists, media workers and communicators in 55 countries and 40, 14 chapters around the world. And in many of these communities, we are journalists dealing with conflict, climate change, and gender-based violence, all of which intersectionally involve and impact women disproportionately. And so in our work, we're looking to technologies to create a digital safe house where we've done in the Philippines and in other places where we are able to create a resource hub coaching and support for journalists who are undergoing attacks online and helping to direct and navigate them to resources to be able to help mitigate and lessen some of the harms that they might experience. Also, we're using the technologies to be able to deliver education using meme journalism, if you'd like to call it that, or other social types of journalism in order to be able to intersect our publics where they are. And so the Generation Zeitgeist curriculum you see here comes with visual wall posters that can be hung in schools and other different types of educational institutions, short TikTok videos that help explain 
in teachable moments and intersect you just as you are getting ready to post something on TikTok and helping you understand the algorithms behind a platform like TikTok that is being uh, under fire currently here in the United States because of some of the spying, particularly of journalists using that particular platform. And so our goal through all of these strategies is to make sure that we are using the technologies to educate, to inform, to collaborate, and to ensure that we are co-creating our technologies and innovations with the communities that we are serving. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Ferrier. We're now going to hear from Dr. Patrice Johnson, the Chief Program Officer of Black Girls Code. Thank you. Thank you. So it is a true joy to be here with all of you at the UN today with like-minded leaders who are working toward equity and who see a equitable future. My name is Patrice Johnson. I bring you greetings from Detroit, but I am very proud to represent Black Girls Code. Our name alone is quite a bold statement. Black Girls Code. It simply means that black girls are genius, that they can build, create, and lead in a way that is innovative and creates change. In our work, we are putting black girls first in technology. Since our inception, We've supported and provided a safe space for over 30,000 girls here in the U.S. and in South Africa. And while we intend on expanding, over 96% of the girls in our program say that they've learned a new coding skill, while 78% say that they would like to have a career in computer programming. Where in the world are people intentionally putting women and girls, particularly black girls, first. We aim to do so and to use technology as a tool, not only to spark their curiosity and their interest, but to encourage their leadership, their innate, natural leadership. Recently, CNN reported that there are several women tech leaders who are transitioning. They are ready to retire, and who could blame them? And my question for all of you is, who will then take their place? I submit Amaya, Madison, Ife, who are here today, and all Black Girls Code students Please give them a round of applause. They've been in our program some since first grade. And I assure you, they are more than capable to be the next tech leaders. Our programming challenges their critical thinking and inspires their leadership journey. We watch as they learn how to work together as a team during hackathons and create tech solutions for everyday problems, even creating mental wellness apps. In all of this, I will promise you that the greatest experience as a leader is watching them in their joy. It is infectious. It is enough to fill up an entire room, even a room here at the UN. In a world where girls who look like me must navigate the intersection of race, gender, and class, we see this as an opportunity to do the impossible, to not only provide rigorous technical knowledge in web and app development or art and music coding, but to empower girls to be problem solvers and create stronger economies. 
Thus, I tricked you. The work is not simply tech. The work is social justice. One of my most treasured moments as a leader in this organization is asking myself the question, why Black Girls Code? Why Black Girls Code and ask that question multiple times? To teach black girls how to code, but why? To challenge the tech ecosystem, but why? Because if we can get black girls to challenge tech, we can challenge every other industry, but why? Because if we inspire the liberation of black girls, we inspire the liberation of everybody. So technology is simply the creative avenue for social justice and for change. And at Black Girls Code, we are boldly doing our part by letting the world know that black girls like Amaya, Madison, and Ife are genius. Thank you. About which we had no doubt, but we are delighted to have it reinforced. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Diana Lekacha, Yekacha, Professor Yelacha, I beg your pardon. Professor in the film department of Brooklyn College. She's going to talk about the highlight of the role of media and technology in human rights and the intersection between media, screen technology, and trauma. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your introduction, and thank you to the organizers for having me among this esteemed um, uh, peers and colleagues. Um, I will be, I will be um, speaking, as uh, Jane mentioned, on uh, media, screen technologies, and trauma from a human rights perspective. I'm a film and media scholar and educator, um, and I will, I'm thinking through uh, these important questions uh, from a theoretical perspective uh, that includes ethics um, and ethical approaches to technologies. Depending on who invents, creates, or develops new technologies, they inherently become differently accessible, available, usable, or even attuned to the needs of different social groups, women included, or should we say women and girls most often excluded. For instance, photography and film are nowadays not new technologies, but they once were. And speaking of the importance of who works on the inter interventions or inventions of new technologies, we nowadays know that for many decades, photo and film cameras and lenses were perfected in such a way so as to decidedly favor and better capture lighter skin tones. This privileging has embedded in and therefore inherent to the camera technology itself. We see the same scenario playing out all over again with facial recognition technology, for example, which cuts across both racial and gender lines. This is why it is imperative that any new and emerging technologies be developed by as many diverse groups as possible and with diverse and inclusive sets of concerns from the start. Speaking of film once being a new technology, let me tell you a quick story. Any film history textbook will tell you that the Lumiere brothers invented cinema in 1895, even though many other people, um, many other people were working on this uh, invention at the same time, including at least one woman, Alice Guy Blaché, who is rarely mentioned in film history textbooks, but who was an early film pioneer and made the very first known fictional film uh, and fantasy film, The Cabbage Fairy, 1896. She is a hidden figure, as women have often been throughout the history of technological development, always there, always contributing, but their work and contribution systematically ignored, dismissed, or erased from history books altogether. This is how patriarchy works. Some achievements and experiences are systemically overrepresented and others underrepresented, if not entirely erased. I use the term hidden figure, so you may as well draw a connection to the film of Hidden Figures, which is about black women doing amazing science at NASA in the face of racism and segregation. 
I will pivot to our contemporary media landscape and technology and consider screen technologies and trauma in particular. Why trauma? I am interested in the question of whose stories and whose experiences tend to be rendered visible and who's invisible in today's landscape of digital oversaturation with screen technology. Cameras and screens are everywhere, but not everyone's story gets seen. Related to this is the relationship with screens and their ability or inability to aid us in the ethical imperative to bear witness to trauma, atrocity, discrimination, and other forms of suffering of individuals and groups across the globe. How do we make digital screen technologies, our phones, tablets, computers, etc., aid us in bearing witness in ethical ways? What do I mean by ethical ways of bearing witness? As Susan Sontag has stated in, at, at looking about looking at the images of human suffering, and I will quote from her, to set aside the sympathy we extend to others beset by war and murderous politics for a reflection on how our privileges are located on the same map as their suffering and may, in ways we might prefer not to imagine, be linked to their suffering, as the wealth of some may imply the destitution of others, is a task for which the painful, steering images supply only an initial spark. Meaning, it is not en enough to merely look at these images and stories of suffering or to know about them. To merely look is to risk perpetuation, the upholding of the status quo, even normalization and omnipresence of suffering that may lead to eventual indifference. What one does with the experience of bearing witness, what one does in the aftermath of it, that is the question. This is where the ethics are. I'm interested in the best practices of engaging the digital media technology landscape towards ethical witnessing that leads to meaningful action, not passive resignation. When we talk about the trauma and pain of others, we need to note that even in, with today's omnipresence of cameras and screens, the suffering of certain populations is still unseen, rendered invisible, or not even considered suffering because these groups are not recognized as fully human subjects to begin with. Their lives are not grievable, as the, uh, theorist Judith Butler would say, which means not able to be grieved. When the, with the ongoing um, devastating war in Ukraine, I took note of the fact when the war started that many in the media focused their disbelief on the fact that this was happening in Europe. I'm a survivor of the Bosnian War, and even though I was too young to know it at the time, I now know that the same or similar discourses were circulating around the war in Bosnia in sharp just juxtaposition to the genocide taking place in Rwanda. The clear implication being that it is more shocking to see white European lives lost as opposed to non-European, non-white lives. We need to urgently decolonize the digital media landscape from such deeply rooted and deeply troubling assumptions. We need to embed in the very creation of new technologies a decolonizing mission that will in turn become inherent to them. AI, which has been mentioned, is increasingly a major factor at the intersections of media, science, technology, art, and entertainment. As researcher Ishwar K. Puri recently stated, and I quote, our students are going to use this technology and we need to teach them how to use it responsibly. We need to harness the power of AI for the public good, end quote. Also recently, an LA Times opinion piece asked, is it time to start considering pers personhood rights for AI chatbots? There are going to increasingly be debates about this. If new technologies, including digital media, cameras, screens, and AIs are not decolonized from the assumptions about some human lives not even being considered lives, and if they are not harnessed towards the greater public good which includes ethical forms of bearing witness, ethical ways of being in the world, and creating meaningful action, we may well soon indeed see a time where certain AIs will gain more personhood rights than many vulnerable human populations have across the globe, women and girls included. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yalacha. I want to just point out that we heard this again in the coverage of 
the war in Ukraine, an employee of a major network announced that it was so surprising that this was taking place in a civilized country, as if all those other wars were among uncivilized people and therefore their due because they are third world, not like us, etc. And may I point out that that person is still employed. Remarks next from Mia Shand Dand, Shah Dand, CEO of Lighthouse 3 and founder of Women in AI Ethics Initiative. Thank you, Jane. Right. Can you all hear me? No. A little louder. Like a all right. Just lean forward a bit there. Is this better? better. All right. It's wonderful to be here today. This is my first time at the UN. And I think for some of you as well, so it's an exciting day. I'm absolutely honored to be here uh, with my esteemed colleagues. Uh, I got goosebumps, Patrice, Dr. Johnson, <laughs> when I heard you talk. Uh, and it's wonderful to see the future sitting right here in the room with us. I'm Mia Shadant. I'm the CEO of Lighthouse 3. I'm the founder of Women in AI Ethics. I started in the tech industry at eBay. eBay, as some of you might recall, was bigger than Amazon at one time. As Jane said, it was a very different time. Facebook was the new kid on the block, if you can believe that. And Netflix used to send out DVDs. You know those circular things? <laughs> they used to go out in the mail. I was recruited by Google. It was my, coincidentally, it was my last corporate role. I managed the community team. And after I left, the reason I left Google is as a single mother and as an immigrant, the tech industry is a very tough place. It's hard to manage the balance between life and work. And it's still the holy grail that people are seeking today. I didn't have the support system that a lot of folks take for granted for working mothers in this country. So I left because I realized that no amount of leaning in is going to change the systemic issues that women, especially women of color, women without privilege, face in the tech industry. So that was when I started Lighthouse 3. It's an emerging technology consulting and advisory firm based in California and I lived in Oakland before I moved to New York. I also started hosting tech meetup groups. So these were small community events, free, and we would meet in a coffee shop. And I would bring in pizza, I would pay for the food, and we would sit there and just discuss what's latest in the technologies. And my goal was simple. How do we get people outside of the tech bubble to get inside an insider view of what's happening in technology because so many people are left out of those conversations. And from a small coffee shop, we grew to hundreds and then thousands, and we got sponsors from Microsoft and Google and IBM, and we got speakers from all these companies who would come and join us. And there was one thing I noticed as I'm hosting these events. There are no women. the technology conversations are always dominated by men. And it's, it's a well-known fact. If you ask anyone in the tech industry, they admit it, yes, this is a problem. And they point to the STEM pipeline. And they say there are not enough women in STEM. There are not enough women who are qualified. So it was around 2018. And as you may recall, um, 
Dr. Timnit Gabru and Dr. Joy Bulwini came out with gender shades. It was a seminal study which showed that facial recognition technologies do not work as accurately on people with dark skin. So I dug around a little bit more and I realized that it wasn't that women weren't qualified or there weren't women in STEM. They were just being overlooked. That was the year I published the first 100 brilliant women in AI ethics list. People were stunned, people were shocked because all they knew were these five women <laughs> who worked in the space, and they said, you're saying there are 95 more? <laughs> I said, there are many more. And what the purpose and the mission of women in AI ethics is, is to highlight that we have those hidden figures in our communities, in our workspace. They're with us, they're in this room right now. The real question is, are they being recognized? Are they being recognized and rewarded for the work that they're doing. So in 2014, the tech companies started publishing their diversity reports. And I'm all in favor of transparency, right? Who isn't? We love transparency. So we found out that we have not made much progress in the tech workspace when it comes to diversity. Black employees as a percentage of the tech industry workforce is still in single digits. And I'm glad that I'm working with colleagues, I'm sitting here right here with folks who are trying to change that. But even when it comes to women, uh, women have made progress. But even then, they are underrepresented in tech. We know there are a lot of women who leave the workforce like myself and we start our own companies, which is great, but the venture capitalists, the people who fund these companies, these startups, are also white men. And research has shown that minority-led teams do really well. They deliver more results, they are better performing, but the folks who run the VC firms apparently don't agree because only Less than 2%, less than 2% of the total VC funding goes to women. Less than 1% goes to black founders. So those are very hard things to get over. These are really hard challenges that no amount of leaning in is going to solve, which is why we exist, why our organization exists, to help women break those barriers. So let's summarize the challenges right now that we are trying to address is, one is the reason you see this technological gap, the diversity gap, is because women are not in the room. They're not in the room, they're not invited. Even when they're invited, they're expected to have really high qualifications. A lot of women that we host at our events are women who work in this field have multiple degrees. There are many advanced degrees, but the badge of honor in the tech industry is a Stanford dropout. But that only works if you're a white male. And then, last but not the least, women's needs are not considered. So first, they are not in the room, then they're not heard, and then you have to be ultra qualified to even get in. But once you, add, you have a seat at the table, how do you make sure that the technology you're building reflects you, your needs? A lot of technologies that we talked about, we talked about facial recognition, we have deep fakes, which is where you can superimpose anyone's face onto anyone's body, so you can see the implications for women. There are this tracking, the surveillance, which impacts women more than men. So there are a lot of technological innovations which are supposed to help us, which are supposed to take us forward, but they're leaving a large section, 50% of humanity, behind. So how do we change this? So women in AI ethics, we, so I have some good news, bad news. <laughs> the bad news is there's no one answer. And I think if everybody here on this desk and even in this room is trying to address these. And because we all bring our skill sets, we all bring our 
different, we all wear different hats, but it will take all of us coming together to f change these issues because there is no one simple solution. So we have been supporting since 2018 women who work in this field. We've hosted, uh, we have a database with over 800 women who work in this field. This is a response to anyone who says there aren't enough qualified women. It's free, it's online, it's open. There is no excuse. For manals, no excuse. For vanals, like the white-only panels or male-only panels, there's no excuse. Not in 2023 anymore. We've also been publishing an annual list since 2018. We highlight the women in this field, not just the well-known women, women who are up and coming, because it is hard to be a woman in the tech industry. It's harder to be a woman of color in tech industry. You know what the hardest thing is? To be a woman if, of color who works on ethics. <laughs> because you're slowing okay. down in progress, <laughs> right? That's what they say. You're trying to build a more equitable world. You're trying, trying to build a more equal world, but there are a lot of folks who think this is slowing things down. And maybe that is what we need to do. We need to slow things down. We need to make sure technolog technological innovation includes all of us, not just a few of us or few of them. It has to be everyone. We launched a mentoring program during the pandemic because there were so many folks who were struggling. They lost their opportunities, they lost their internships, a lot of companies revoked their job offers and we came together as a community to support each other. A lot of women stepped up. They helped build up these women who lost so many of these opportunities and helped each other. And there is a lot of power and solidarity. When you have each other, you're so much stronger and you can lift each other up. At our events, we have invited a diverse group of women. We don't believe the future is just more engineers or more computer scientists. We want that. We want more diversity, but we also want diversity of backgrounds. We had uh, Dr. Um, Doreen Bogdan Martin, who spoke at one of our events. She keynoted. We've had uh, Dr. Timnit Gebru, who was fired by, from Google, by the way, for raising ethical issues. We had Dr. Meredith Whitaker, who was formerly with the FTC as an AI advisor. She's now uh, the CEO of um, Signal, the encrypted, encrypted messaging app. We've had folks from ACLU. We've had uh, sex worker organizers because sex workers are the canary in the coal mine of technology. Every issue that the rest of us face they are the first ones who have adopted these technologies and who better to tell us what the pitfalls are. So we look at a cross section, we believe it's going to take a lot more than just engineers and computer scientists to solve these problems. We will need to support them with the policies, the regulations, uh, funding. We need to do a lot more to support these women. So this, I truly believe, and this is our mission, is that technology impacts all of us. And we all need to have a say in how it's built and how it's deployed. And I'll leave you with these words by author Arundhati Roy. A different world is not only possible, she's on her way. She is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathe. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. And last but not least, we'll hear from Karen Orantes, the acting chief of the UN social media team. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me here. Very excited uh, to speak to all of you today. We've heard a lot about how technology poses a lot of challenges. We've heard TikTok, we've heard a number of social media platforms spoken about. I want to talk to you about how we're trying to use those same platforms for positive for good, for advancing the issues of gender equality and so many other social justice issues. So um, my team runs right now about 38 uh, social media platforms in nine different languages. 
Um, those are all the at United Nations and at UN platforms that you might find in those different languages. And we've got about 65 million followers right now, so we do have a very big platform that we take this responsibility very seriously to really get the message of the UN out there, not least on gender equality. And gender equality for us is not only an issue per se, as in International Women's Day, we talk about CSW, we talk about girls that code, we talk about all these issues, but we also use the gender lens across all other issues. Um, so I wanna talk to you a little bit about both our editorial practices and how we put that into practice on a daily basis and the focuses that we have on our platforms. On the communication strategy side, we have an inclusive communication strategy and very, very strict editorial guidelines for both text content and any visual content. So one of the bigger fights that we've had for a long time and we, we've made some progress is photo guidelines. For example, I challenge all of you to go on at UN right now and find me a photo that doesn't have a woman in it. This has been something that hasn't been easy because you know, as much as we have the Secretary General as a very strong advocate for gender equality and a very self-proclaimed feminist, the UN is a very old institution and we're still fighting against the manals and we're you know, still trying very, very hard to make sure that there's women in all senior leadership positions, as you've heard the Secretary General said, but also women on all big trips, women in all the big missions, women in peacekeeping. Um, so we've made it our policy that if there is a great picture, even of a great trip of the Secretary General or a great event, we're not going to use it unless there's a woman in it. This is <laughs> and not only do we check that there's women in our picture, but we also look, have a very close look at what roles these women have in those pictures. What's the power balance? Is the women is always the recipients of the UN aid? The women are the people who get from the UN. The women are the people or even just like me in the communications roles, right? The traditional roles that women have always had in the UN too. We wanna highlight the women in the positions of power, both within the UN and as working with the UN in civil society, in all the other fields. So we've got the women in peacekeeping, we've got the women senior leaders, we've got our deputy secretary general, we've got a lot of under secretary generals in traditionally more male sectors, um, Rosemary Di Carlo in, in political and, and uh, peace building. We've got many um, resident coordinators in field missions, in crisis situations. And those are the things that people are not so used to seeing that we really wanna highlight in our accounts and that's really important to us. And honestly, it's also really getting to a point where that's much easier. A couple of years that was still harder to find these women. Now there's many more examples of that. Um, so we are working closely with the photographers, with the news teams, with all our other teams to make sure that this is a big focus. Because obviously it's not just a focus for social media, it's a focus for all our uh, global, uh, global communications departments. Um, another point I wanted to raise and that's very important to us is also knowing our audiences. So we've got 65 million followers, but we also need to know who they are and we look at that very often very closely and we're always surprised because of some platforms, you would think that there's more of a female audience than a male audience, but right now, at least if we look at the statistics across all our platforms and all our languages, the majority of our followers are men. It's an opportunity, it's something to do with what you have mentioned, Leah, also about you know the percentage of men versus women being online. It's also something to do with the statistics, which we're having a closer look at because, again, it's getting better, but it used to be that the platform skewed male because whenever there wasn't a clear definition, when people wouldn't self-identify as one or the other, the tendency, it would automatically go to male, right? So if you have an overwhelming percentage of men, it might just be an AI tool or an algorithm or a platform estimate that says, oh, those are more men because where, people don't self-identify, platforms sometimes go by behavior. They think if you have a certain behavior on the platform that they can guess if you're a man or a woman. We all know that there's a long wrong with that to begin with, right? Um, so we have these numbers, we look at the, num at the numbers, but we take them with a grain of salt. And we try to find ever new platforms and ever new ways to reach female audiences and to reach them more and also to use AI tools in our favor. And again, we are all aware of the pitfalls and the challenges of a lot of these tools 
but we think that that's all the more reason why we need to be there, why we need to be on these platforms, why we need to use these tools um, to forward our agenda as well. Another thing that's very important for us is um, to use, of course, any opportunity we get to feature women in international days. I mean, we have a lot. You mentioned uh, girls and women in, in ICT. We have, of course, International Women's Day now. Um, we have uh, NFGM Day, Women's History Month. Uh, uh, women in, we just had International Day of Women Judges. So all of those are good opportunities to highlight it. But again, like I said, we want to see it as a red thread throughout. Whenever we talk about conflict, the role of women in conflict, um, and the role of women in peace building and peacekeeping, the role of women in crisis, the role of women in climate, the role of women in the water crisis, both as the victims and also as part of the solution to all of these crises. Um, uh, indigenous women, young women, issues like child marriage, of course, all of those run throughout um, our editorial calendar and are issues that we want to highlight throughout. Um, and then, of course, we've got the Secretary General, like I said, as one of our um, biggest spokespeople on gender issues, a very self-proclaimed feminist, and we're very, working very hard to show his vision and to share his vision with our 65 million followers, and also to show it's not a women's issue, right? We, it's so important to have men speaking out on gender equality, and not just on I have my colleague here who's also seeing this Women's Day and one of the top comments we get every year across every platform, but when is it Man's Day? You know, it's exactly every other day of the year, exactly. So those, those are just some of the issues that we want to highlight and where we want to also use social media as a two-way communication to engage with people. Not just to throw out our messages, but to say, yes, we hear you. Yes, there is men's day, and yes, you know, this is not just a women's issue. We need everybody on board. We have a lot of male spokespeople on this issue as well. And then, of course, we see our accounts not only as uh, highlighting our content, as in the Secretary General and whatever happens here at the Secretariat, but also content from across the UN system. People come to the UN, and they don't think that UNICEF is actually across the street, and, you know, UNFPA is separate, and UN... Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to attack you with my pen there. Um, UNHCR is separate, but we want to highlight content from across the system. And there is so much good gender content out there. Not only UN Women and, of course, UNFPA, but, you know, uh, campaigns from, say, UNESCO on careers have no gender or the world needs science and science needs women. You know, con content like uh, policies on parental leave from ILO. So content from across the UN system is... Uh, very important to us to highlight and to really bring to our followers and to use those platforms that we have to speak to those 65 million people and hopefully many more um, to really get the message out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. We've been asking how we get more women and girls into STEM careers, first stage. STEM studies. Well, we have three examples. We'd like Dr. Johnson to call some of her young women from Black Girls Code up to the front to tell us about what they've been doing. This is really the future. Welcome, ladies. Somebody like to go down to the end? You can.
We have been hearing but that black girls code, now we're going to hear how. Hi, my name is Madison Clark. Um, I've been a part of Black Girls Code since I was in the first grade. Um, Black Girls Code has helped me become more confident. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Black Girls Code has helped me become more confident in myself, made me believe in myself. Anybody who has told me I'm not, I cannot, Black Girls Code has told me multiple times I can. Um, a couple years ago, I rang the bell at the New York Stock Exchange, which was an amazing experience. Um, and being just meeting people and like these ladies here, just it's a family at the end of the day. And being a part of a family and such a close group is so impactful and so important, especially become, being a young black woman in today's society. Like you guys said, women and being a woman in general is hard enough because we're told we can't or we're not, the room is not for us. And I believe. Black Girls Code has really, really, really told me, you can, no matter what, your skin color, being a woman, it doesn't matter. You can do anything you put your mind to, and you are important, you are impactful, and you can do anything you want. Tell us where you're in school, Madison, before you hand it off to your colleague. I go to Eastside Community High School um, by 14th and 1st Ave, and I'm in 10th grade. Very good. Next. Hi, my name is Ife Joseph. I'm 13 years old and a proud member of Black Girls Code. I joined my first class when I was about in first grade and kept going ever since. Black Girls Code has given me exposure to coding and what I want for my future and opportunities I never would have had otherwise. An example, me being here or when I joined a class for BIT, and that led me on to getting nominated for Time Magazine's Kid of the Year. Um, I, I never would have had these opportunities otherwise. I wouldn't be the same person without this program, so I want to thank everyone who put in work for the program, and thank you, panelists, for this very eye-opening speech. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anaya, and I've been doing Black Girls Code since I was seven years old. <laughs> Not only did Black Girls Code teach me how to code, make websites, code robots, it opened me up to so many wonderful opportunities. In 2019, I got invited to a NASA Space Apps Challenge, where I, become the, where I became the youngest person ever to win the Person's Choice Award. I invented a prototype to clean microplastics out of the water. But I owe Black Girls Code so much of my life. It, really changed me to, for who I am today, and I could not be more thankful. And where are you in school, Amaya? Where are you, in, where are you a student? Where are you a student, dear? Oh, I'm homeschooled. You're homeschooled. Oh. <laughs> Bravo, mom. And all the moms and dads. Then I guess the next question is, how do you get a first, how do you get these young people into STEM interest and coding in first grade? How do you get into the schools? How do you start there? You know, one of the things that's very special about BGC is it, it has started with a grassroots tradition and it continues with a grassroots tradition. So we have about 15 chapters, um, one in South Africa and several across the US and uh, staff members like Jaylene who was here this morning who you know pound the pavement, they pound the pavement and so that's how we've been able to have such a groundswell of connecting with students. And I believe, you know, as, as we continue to expand, we've got to keep that grassroots nature. 
And if I, so if you I, go into schools and present yourselves as a program. Is this an after-school program, an extracurricular program? You could consider it extracurricular, but uh, from my perspective, the engagement level is, is multi-tiered. So we have a virtual program, we have a uh, community-based chapter program, and then we work with schools. Yes, you had a question. I wanted to just add, uh, build, build on that, um, and, and sh give a shout out to all the teachers out there uh, who are doing amazing jobs. My daughter is here as well. She's a sixth grader at the uh, Brooklyn Green School, and uh, shout out to her amazing science teachers, Sava, um, who are encouraging girls day in and day out all the students, but girls in particular, and doing an amazing job. She's in love with science and with math, so shout out to public school teachers everywhere. Indeed, very much so. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, raise your hand, activate your microphone, and speak. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, sorry for that because of the mic. Okay, sure. Sorry, we are all learning every time. <laughs> yes. So with this, uh, I I have been moved by all the speakers, the AI, Blackhead, Gold, and all that. And uh, within the South African region, there are those initiatives. However, people pay for them. And because of that, we don't get the engagement and the enthusiasm for us to implement it. So being a project manager for about 15 years, I have decided to set up a club whereby I train young girls in project management, and then I get collaborations for graphic designs. And what we do with the results is to create little uh, flyers and apps for SME, needy women who are, startup, who are doing startup businesses so that they can advertise their products. Now, I want to ask Patricia, with your team able to do coding, can we collaborate with you so that we can now start setting up uh, websites for those market women and SME traders so that they can have their own sales apps to scale up their advertising and their inter-trade with other countries online? Digital trade, innovation at a lower cost. Number one, the benefits I envisage is one, we groom the skills of those children that we are training currently in West Africa who cannot pay. Number two, we, uh, we empower the market women to get involved in the digital environment. And number three, create businesses at lower cost for the larger community. So we do have, I, I heard you say South Africa. We do have a chapter in South Africa right now. And we have a great team of volunteers who steward that chapter. So right now we have about four or five events a year and they're having their first hybrid summer camp. Um, so I would say there is a connection to working together. So perhaps afterwards we can exchange contact information um, and see how we can at least connect you with the South Africa chapter. So I'm speaking of West Africa. So we, we don't have a chapter in the West Africa region yet. There is an interest in Ghana. Um, so, but I, I think it's still worthwhile to connect. Sure, mm -hmm. thanks. Yes, all the way in the back there, yes. Thank you very much. In the last, uh, in the last row. Is that me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I, my name is Faustina Boachi. I'm from Ghana. And I am concerned about the elderly. We just say women and girls. We never distinguish between, you know, the generations. And, and uh, I'm very worried about 
elderly women, you know, in Ghana, for example, elderly women who have their children abroad buy phones for them, send them money, and all that. But they are not able to use it. So somebody has to do the mobile money and take her money for her, whether it's the correct amount and that kind of thing. She doesn't know, but she doesn't have um, the knowledge. I'm not saying we should train elderly women, you know, in the media and that kind of thing. They won't be able to Why do not? it. Why not? Why not? Well, well I, I'm, I'm not talking about the literate elderly people. I'm talking about rural grassroots grandmothers and mothers. They, they, they don't know anything about what we are talking about, but we can help them. I'll give you an example. There is gender-based violence against the elderly in Ghana. Every woman will grow up to be a witch, you know. They are banished from home, they are beaten up, they are killed. What the digital world is doing now is everybody hangs around when the woman is being beaten and filming. They are not going there to help the woman or rescue them. And they will film and put it on social media. It's a good thing because it creates awareness. People, people are now seeing these things. But where is the help due to digital? They put it on social media, people spread it, and there are a million views. But what has the digital world done to curb you know, uh, this kind of uh, violence against the elderly? Thank you. Let's I'm think going about to it. I'm going to Thank stop you. you. It's an excellent question, and we're going to have an answer. And what we are going to ask members of the audience to do is keep your questions a bit more concise. We all have uh, things to say, and they're all important, but we do want to keep our, our questions and answers concise so that we can have more of them. Answer. I think that's a great question. So I will first start by just saying how it's upon all of us to also protect the women who are going into the workforce. Uh, we have a bright future in front of us, but only if we nurture them and when we allow them to thrive. So it was wonderful to hear from all of you. So uh, to answer your question, uh, one of uh, the things that has been concerning is how a lot of talk about technology leaves out uh, a lot of folks who don't have access. Like in the United States, 40% of the households do not have access to the internet. So that has been a concern for us, that we are looking into non-digital assets, looking at how, uh, because the challenge with social media is everybody has become an armchair activist, and people are not as connected and grounded in their communities as they used to, and we are trying to make that more of us a core of the work that we do, bring resources into communities which are focused on two things, which is uh, safety uh, and economic empowerment. Uh, but we're still working towards that, but that's a very fair concern. It is an excellent concern and the fact that, in a sense, everyone is a journalist. Everyone is not an expert. Everyone is not ethical. Everyone is not trained, which means if John Q. Public runs out with his cell camera with his cell phone and takes pictures, we may or may not be getting the full truth, which is something that we in the media in New York City have been grappling with. But on the other hand, I have two words for you, George Floyd. So therefore, it is very important for people to contain, to continue rather, to continue to when they see something, make sure they say something via their telephone cameras, via their voices, via social media. Let me go to this person in the, yes. Sheila, you're pointing out someone? Very good. Me. May we go uh, to this woman, please? Hi, yes, good afternoon. My name is Gail Davis, and I represent uh, quite a few um, NGOs, but I have uh, two very quick 30-second statements, and I'd love your answers, anyone. First of all, I'd like to know from Karen Orientes and the young lady, I can't see too well with my glasses, the woman uh, next to Dr. Patrice Johnson. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you something. You said something about enterprise design thinking. That's something a lot of people don't know about. And it's actually where people can come together. If you would say a little bit more about that, of how we can actually use that for what the woman in the back said. How could we use that and journalists and citizens to actually educate people on the, the right way to, you know, to be connected and present to what's going on if there's a problem, but at the same time also view what's going on so that it goes out and there is a record of it. So what I'm saying, educate people to do something about something in the moment, but at the same time, if there's somebody on the side, for them to also video it so that the police have it or something like that, but also educate them to help the person in the moment. And then the last thing I want to ask Karen Orientis about transmedia storytelling, where you, where you tell the story across different platforms based on what the platform is needed for. If you, I know what it is, but if you explain that to the NGOs, that is something that they can utilize. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And yes, I think there's two key points in what you've said. One, in order to be able to build for safety as well as resiliency, we need multi-platform strategies because the problem is intersectional and the solutions for one platform are causing harms on another platform. And especially as journalists who are using all of these multiple platforms, the solutions that have come out technologically don't work across those different platforms. And so the policies and terms and conditions of one platform may cause harms in the work of a journalist on another platform. Um, and speaking about the practices, et cetera, I think it's really key in the work that we do is helping journalists as well as other communicators understand how to see differently, how to be able to use dialogic practices, ways of convening, ways of hosting and gathering people in physical space as well as in virtual spaces to be able to connect, to understand, the literacy and characteristics of the communities that they're serving and design around and with people in the community so that they're solving for those edge cases, those uh, canaries in the coal mine that are experiencing the disproportionate harms from the technologies themselves. And so through the practices, I'm gonna give you just one example. Um, actually, we did tackle in Ethiopia, the issue of gender-based violence. We had a population of about 50 journalists, gender split, uh, pretty balanced between the two groups. And one of the things that we discovered, not only in talking about the issue of gender-based violence, we talk about gender-based violence as if it doesn't happen to men. And we discovered in our workshop that men also um, have pain that they haven't been able to express vi verbally or in any other way because of the harms that have come to them. And so we have allies in the room who have experienced things similar to us that we need to reach out to. And it was through this convening process and using both a physical space as well as online spaces to have us have a conversation about how we talk about gender-based violence, how we display it online, the challenges of our algorithms and being able to even talk about our own body parts in a way that doesn't get it taken down by the technologies and allow us to be able to train people in these practices, both virtual, as I said, and face-to-face, -face, so that they can bring people together and use the talents and skills they have at the level where they are. If I may just quickly, ahead, on the trans creation. Um, so yes, we try to use platforms to the best, uh, best practices per platform. And this is a question that we often get. You know, people come to us and say, oh, I'm having this event. Here is two sentences about it. Put it ac out across every platform and make it go viral, right? Um, of course, it doesn't work that way, as you have alluded to, right? It's super important for us to understand the platforms, understand the developments on the platforms, because they change constantly, and then adapt content to what the platform needs, what the audiences on these platforms need, um, and how to make it most interactive for each platform. Be that through, a while ago it was quizzes on Instagram stories, right? Or be that through comment monitoring and responding to comments and really engaging with audiences. But yes, very important point to really work on the best practices per platforms and transcreate content that works across platforms. Yes. Thank you so much. 
No, we can't hear you. You have to turn it on, and then it will go red. And then, yes, ah. now. Okay, well, um, I'd actually like to um, do a little microphone training for everybody. Most microphones function best when you are as close to them as you can get. And I once told a singer that she had fabulous songs and a beautiful voice, but she needed to make love to the microphone. Okay. Uh, I'm Marsha Brondi from uh, the mountains of British Columbia, and I am in the middle of building a digital archive on equity in apprenticeship and technical fields. We currently have 55,000 documents scanned and OCR'd, and 800 of them have their metadata. We are looking for, like chat GPT came out, and I thought, oh, and then we tried it, and it was like, no, you don't get it. Um, what we want, we are dedicated for this freely available, publicly accessible, full text digital archive, which will ultimately be housed at the um, British Columbia Institute of Technology in their digital archive. We are looking to ensure that plain language questions from anywhere in the world, and sorry, it has to at this point be mostly in English, some French, but mostly English, plain language questions would be able to discover um, the documents in the archives that are meaningful to that question. It sounds like it should be simple, but it's not. And it will require some kind of AI. And so I have flyers like this. If any of you have any ideas about who might like to work on such a thing, um, it's, uh, I would really value it. I totally appreciate everybody on the panel. I myself am a construction carpenter, a Red Seal construction carpenter with a PhD in technology studies. So. Thank you very much. We look forward to the archive. Yes, we have a question over here. Everyone. Yes, now. Good morning, everyone. I am Sandra from Mauritius, member of the parliament and member of the Pan-African Parliament. I would like to share with you my uh, statement. I am a former radio and television presenter I've been working on the Mauritius Broadcasting Corporation for more than 20, uh, 20 years. And uh, my last challenge on television was to be the host of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. And I'm also a former singer and artist. And uh, at the end of my career on radio and television, I was offered a ticket to be uh, a candidate for the general election in 2019. And uh, this by the Prime Minister, the actual Prime Minister, the Honorable Pravin Kumar Jagnut. And I accepted that ticket, and I was the first elected member of my constituency in Black River, Rivière Noir. But as that moment when I chose to swap from the radio and television to become another kind of public figure on, in politics, I witnessed what we call bullying, what we call political vi online violence, violence with, uh, against women on uh, Facebook and all kinds of social medias. And uh, today my appeal is that I've been very touched by all the testimonies of those uh, courageous and wonderful girls from uh, Black Code Girl. I would like to make an appeal and see how we can all work together because I think that sometimes women are not solidarity with women on social media. Sometimes we are victims of bullying, and this bullying comes come from women themselves. We can see men. We've seen, we've heard that there are so many men. They are so no, um, uh, numerous on social media. But what about women? What is our role? What are we doing to protect to protect women, to protect our sisters? Thank you very much. A good question. And do we have some responses? 
We've talked a great deal about digital harms. Yes, go right ahead. All right, so yes, we've seen from our research that we've done at Trollbusters, obviously that not only journalists, not only women journalists, but also women politicians have also been very viciously and ferociously attacked online. And I think some of what we have tried to do is really help not only individual journalists and communicators, but the general public understand the, the complexity of how some of those harms happen and the disproportionate impact of those harms. It's not just as some people see online, perhaps a, a nasty tweet. Sometimes they, what they don't see is the sub-level conversations that are happening, the back channel bad videos and pictures that you're receiving, or the emails that come to you directly, or the texts that come to your phone because you've been doxxed and your information is available to the public, or your home address has been shared and somebody comes to your front door or sends you a death threat. And so we're very cognizant of that, and yet we see that our platforms have not put in place the types of mitigation strategies. We see that Twitter has just recently disbanded their whole trust team and committee to be able to help people move through this strategy. We've watched as groups like Facebook have attempted to try and remedy these types of things with a panel to help address these specific cases. However, Getting through that pipeline and getting a human to be able to review the material has been the key challenge. The platforms are profiting off of the pain and the emotional content and the fervor that's happening, especially against women journalists and politicians where we see those sustained types of campaigns online by bad actors that are both state actors as well as perhaps misogynistic elements in the culture that are also trying to drum women's voices out of politics, out of the parliament, out of uh, the legislative bodies, and off of the airwaves themselves. The solution um, is in networking, is in collaboration, is in bringing together, as we do at the International Association of Women in Radio and Television, bringing our sisters together across the globe to push back against those reputation damage that comes from these types of attacks, the personal harms that come to you physically as a result of these attacks, and help raise awareness as well as direct you to the resources to understand how to create the boundaries both online as well as in your physical space to keep you protected, and to make sure that you understand the behaviors that you are using that you can uh, use ongoingly to keep yourself protected. So unfortunately, um, in the work that we do and what I've seen around uh, as we look at convergence and understanding how we can build for technologies that solve for the worst cases, especially women journalists and politicians, we have to work together to push that agenda at the tech level to make sure that the platforms themselves are putting policies in place and alternate pathways for us to get those, uh, those sustained campaigns squashed as well as at the legislative level an opportunity for us to be able to prosecute those bad actors and see that they are not operating with impunity in the future. Thank you. And if I can quickly add here, I'm now going to make love to the microphone. Um, uh, this is a, another important issue here, uh, going back to uh, screen and trauma, is that th these kinds of attacks do cause real harm. However, because there's a screen disconnect, there is also uh, this sense by the people perpetrating this kind of violence that, that they're not actually necessarily even talking to real people. They're talking to avatars. So we need to m uh, do more work in this comes it has to start early with critical media literacy um, of um, uh, creating better practices, crea creating deeper understanding uh, from the get-go for young generations and any generation that these types of acts have real-life consequences. That's really important. Thank you. I'd like to add and echo what my colleagues here said. And it is not just about technology. The way I see it is 
when, when you threaten the system, the system is going to fight back. There is a reason why certain groups of people are in power, others aren't. So if you are trying to change the system, you have to build a solidarity network. And I do not want to frame this as men versus women. This is more about people who want change and people who are against change, people who benefit from the status quo and people who are against it. So technology has been built, a lot of it, by white men. And they have very little vested in changing those. Uh, there was an example given recently, um, Bumble is an app, it's a dating app. It's been presented as a model. It's built by a woman where women have the power to choose first, make the first move, which is unheard of because on most social media apps, or most dating apps, it's always been the men who make the first move and there's been a lot of harassment. So we have to think about and rethink how we build these technologies and how do we build it in a way that's keeping us safe and that will only happen as we get more women into these positions, then that becomes the norm. And right now, I do think this is going to escalate as we are seeing because there are a lot of people who are vested in keeping things as they are and we want to change it. Yes. On that note, we're going to take a break, a 15 minute break. We're going to return and have a few more questions and answers because this is a very lively, intelligent group and very engaged, and we so appreciate that. And so, we're going to take a 15 minute break. We will have a few more Q and A's, after which we will go into our breakout sessions and continue. Thank you very much.